Astrid and I are going to talk about what we prefer to call reopened graves. So that's basically graves that have been disturbed by human uh, activity soon after burial. So such as this early medieval example from France and this early Bronze Age example from Austria. So graves from toponomically, graves from both periods are quite similar. So they are characterized by the interment of the complete body soon after death, usually in a container in a single grave cut in the ground. So traditionally, this type of evidence is ad hoc uh, attributed to grave robbery. So the plundering of graves for valuables as understood today. But detailed research has been carried out recently in the early medieval period and has shown, so Astrid has carried out the regional study in France, then um, some also in the UK and Netherlands and Germany, regional studies have been carried out that show there's actually patterns in object removal which point towards a more cultural practice. Um, in the early Bronze Age, such large scale investigations are still missing. Um, yeah, and to address the, you know, to find out why a grave was reopened, the main questions you, you want, want to know is, you, you have our, what was the original evidence? How did the original evidence look like? When did the reopening take place? And what happened when the grave was reopened? So were human remains or objects removed, deposited? Um, uh, how have the human remains been treated? So that are all interesting questions. And to understand all this, it's in uh, particularly important to understand the taphonomy and in particular to also distinguish between human and natural factors. Yeah, and in this talk, we're going to talk about uh, mainly archaeothanatology, uh, micromorphology, and also a bit of digital archaeology methods that we applied to research these graves. And we will end with some recommendations for future excavations. Okay. So, archaeothanatology. So, as we have heard before, is a study of different biological and sociological aspects of death in ancient populations. So, as many French physical anthropologists, I have been trained in the method, and so I decided to apply it to the specific case of early medieval reopened graves. So, I would like to start my presentation with this grave from the site of Ilfurt in France as an example to show you uh, what questions archaeothanatology can provide answers to. So, this grave contains the remains of a male adult. The first disturbance is located around the neck with deplacement of the cranium, mandible, and some cervical vertebra. And the second disturbance, as you can see, concerns the left part of the skeleton from the forearm to the left femur and also includes uh, the right tibia and fibula. These uh, disturbances concern persistent articulation of the body. Well, the ones that we know today, but which may change in the future, as Clara and Ailey uh, have shown us. So, what is persistent articulation? So, it's articulations that are preserved longer during the decomposition process. So, these elements are not found in condition anymore, means that the body was, in this case, already reduced to a skeleton state, or that the ligament attachments were already very weak at the time of the reopening. Moreover, the way the bone are spread here, so as you can see, without no many damages and quite far, indicates an intervention that occurred in an empty space, which means that the deceased was buried in a container, and most <coughs> importantly in our case, this container was still preserved when the disturbance happened. So, <clears throat> the disturbed bones are, as you can see, in the northeast corner of the grave, and lie about 23 centimeters above the bottom. The most likely theory here is that when the grave was reopened, the, bone, uh, the bones were, were deposited on the lid of the container, which vanished afterwards. The height of this container, so 23 centimeters, is consistent with what we can observe from other medieval coffins discovered in France for more or less the same period. The location of bone disturbances and the study of burial practices at Hitler both suggest that an object placed around the neck of the body was removed. 
and several elements, fragments of iron artifacts have been discovered in the pelvis area, which allow us <coughs> to deduce that additionally, a belt and a weapon were probably taken. So, through this very, very quick presentation of this grave, answers to at least four, five, three, four important questions. Uh, could we change a little bit the slide as well? Four important questions about the reopening have been provided. So, what was the original appearance of the grave? Well, as we see, an emission in a wooden container placed in the half of the rect a rectangular pit. When was the reopening uh, happened? So, before the decay and the collapse of the container, but after the decomposition of the body. So, we think that maybe, I think that maybe it's target reopening, for, not only because of that, but for many uh, evidences. And so, my question is, there is still a surface marker visible at the time of the reopening. What happened when the grave was reopened? Limited and target manipulation of specific areas of the skeleton. So, again, sedated grave and knowledge by the opener of the continent of the grave. So, pendant, bell, weapon probably removed. Nobody, nobody was taken. And the discussion here, the disturbance of the neck is quite unusual in a man's grave in this particular site. So, what kind of pendant of collar was there? And so, I'm really wondering about maybe not just robbery, but maybe something more re symbolic. Uh, yeah, so. So, unfortunately, the question about the reopening of the grave remains here open, but it's not always the case. So, in some cases, the continent of the feeling can provide information on this issue. On the site of Hostel, so still in France, in Alsace, uh, snails have been found in several reopened graves. So, the study carried out by a malacologist reveals that these snails belonging to species that were not going very deep uh, inside, I mean, uh, the soil. So, their presence in the filling of these graves can <coughs> only be explained if the reopening pit uh, remained open after the disturbances. And I think you have mm -hmm. examples too. Yeah, I have similar evidence from early medieval Austria. But I'm not going to talk about this, but about a microarchaeological study that I carried out on a reopened early Bronze Age uh, grave in Austria uh, from a cemetery in the west of Austria. What was found, just to give an overview, was a top male, in, a top individual on the on, on a top undisturbed male individual, and then on, underneath a second uh, male individual that was disturbed. So here you can see the excavation process of the disturbed individual. And as I said, it's a microarchaeological, was a microarchaeological approach. So we did single finds recording, we had seeding of all sediments. Um, and as you can see, uh, also taking micromorphology samples, which can also, I think before there was the, the reasoning that you can't do the micromorphology because you have to leave a profile, or you can also, uh, you know, push them into the ground. And this is actually Rowena who did the micromorphology in, in this case study. Um, so yeah, so we did then uh, 3D modeling, uh, made a movie which reconstructed the excavation process. Micromorphology I've already mentioned. Um, yeah, and then what I did in this case was uh, to apply, you know, to extend the archaeotonatological approach to also to the disturbed bones. So I just uh, uh, described the disturbed bones in the same way as, you know, uh, according to the archaeotonatological protocol, and then put an undisturbed skeleton as a reference in the middle uh, to reconstruct uh, what happened. So I got really quite a lot of data, and I'm just going to do the most important ones now uh, for the reopening question. So yeah, uh, both individuals slipped into uh, Prone, post, uh, semi prone position depositionally, post depositionally. Yeah, and um, from, yeah, an important result was from micromorphology. We know that the, uh, the, the pit that was dug was actually originally much larger and uh, it uh, then slumped af afterwards. So it's actually different to what we saw at excavation. Then from 
from the archaeotanatology, from extending this approach, I got a really detailed uh, picture of what happened. So it was that first the uh, cranium and, and mandible were put aside and then, you know, it, the person sh uh, shifted or moved the bone to the side or to both sides. Um, but without, and it was possible only by one person at a time. Um, but so this, all this could be read as an attempt to actually not do any damage to the bone, which is different to uh, the prevailing uh, interpretation that these uh, reopenings were done by enemies uh, or that these were hostile acts. So you could actually see that there was care taken not to damage the bones, so which is an important result. Uh, yeah, objects were removed. Um, then again, from micromorphology, we know that the grave was refilled immediately. Um, yeah, and then the 3D model showed that actually there was a connection between the uneven positioning of top individual with the uh, subsiding of with the breakdown of the coffin underneath, which was at odds with the C14 results. So we had to uh, reinterpret them. And then also, which also quite a nice uh, result was that we could see that sandy layers from the micromorphology uh, formed from the deca decaying body in the in the coffin and uh, until they reached a stable position until this uh, broke down. Okay. So we would like to conclude this uh, presentation with suggestion on what we think is most important to facilitate analysis of grave disturbances. Just so uh, the ability to identify human activities depends strongly on the quality of the data collected in the field. Hence, we propose adaptation of excavation methodologies and protocols for disturbed graves. So I will probably say some uh, obvious things, but for some of you, maybe it's not. So let's see. And so, for example, during excavation, it is very important to make cross-section to better understand the origin of the disturbance, and not only in the grave, but in also in the reopening pit, if it's possible to really understand how it happened. <coughs> of course, the application of archaeotechnology in the field is very important. It's an important part of that because it provides uh, significantly more information. Five recording forms need to be adapted to disturb graves. And I'm really thinking in particular about uh, the description of the disturbed bones, not only the bones that are still in place, but the disturbed ones too, and in their location, really their location. And I'm also thinking about photographs. Please don't remove the disturbed bones for the photographs, <laughs> because it happens sometimes. And we uh, lose a lot of information of, because of that. And additionally, uh, as we are seeing, especially with Edel, that more advanced types of analysis are available that can contribute greatly where we want to get a more fine-grained picture of what happened. So, I would say that the more precise we can be about the dating of the opening, the type of object removed, the treatment of the body, the closer we can get to the meaning of this act <coughs> and, of course, a better understanding of past societies. Thank you.